we want to first welcome you to today's program. Uh, you can see on your screen here, we're going to be learning all about the upcoming course, uh, Kellogg's Business Analytics Decision Making with Data. Uh, so we're joined here uh, by the program faculty, sort of the, one of the designers of today's course is here with us to tell us all about the program. Uh, here, who's with us today, Florian Settlemeyer, and um, he's going to be taking us through the content of this program and really helping to describe uh, what some of those key learning objectives are and how this program unfolds across time. Uh, so he's here to tell us more about the program. Uh, Professor Settlemeyer is the Nancy L. Ertel Professor of Marketing, a faculty director in the Program on Data Analytics, as well as the chair of the marketing department at the Kellogg School of Management. Very pleased to have you with us here today, Professor Zettelmeyer. Uh, would you like to jump in and say hello? Yes, absolutely. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's really lovely uh, seeing you all here. I'm really excited to tell you about this course, which for us um, is has really been the culmination of a multi-year journey. So we're super excited to be able to offer it. Uh, and I look forward to telling you all about it. Thank you so much, Professor Zettemeyer, for being here today. Uh, there's a lot in store as we learn about the various components of this program, not only what we'll be learning uh, throughout the curriculum, but also how uh, we will be learning. So one of the things we'll do here today um, is tell you a little bit more about the learning experience that you can expect here um, at Northwestern Kellogg. Uh, we're going to start here in the beginning of today's session by telling you more about this community that you're joining here. Um, a little bit later on, after Professor Zettemeyer's uh, presentation, we'll come back and talk more about how the program is delivered, what some of those day-to-day -day aspects are like. Uh, so stay tuned for more on those tactical components towards the end of our session. Um, but as we get started here, uh, we wanted to describe for you this ecosystem that you're joining here, uh, some of the, the learning uh, that you can expect, and, and really describe for you what sets Northwestern apart um, from other uh, educational opportunities. Um, so firstly, uh, you'll see here top Kellogg faculty. You'll have an opportunity uh, to learn in a live session here today um, from uh, one of these uh, faculty members here at Kellogg, um, uh, but really drawing from this, this incredible wealth of knowledge um, housed within a faculty at Northwestern Kellogg and bringing uh, that knowledge to all of you uh, through thoughtful discussion in real time throughout the program. So a big part um, of what sets this program apart in terms of faculty is not only the world's renowned expertise, but also sort of that focus on teaching and learning, that focus on really helping you to bring these theories and concepts into a place of action uh, within your organization and within your lives. Um, a big part of your learning in a Northwestern Kellogg program um, are, are with your peers. So in addition to those faculty relationships that you're building, you have an opportunity to broaden out your professional network, gain peers and colleagues from across the globe uh, throughout your time in this program. So you're learning together with and from a truly diverse uh, cohort of peers that represent many different geographies, many different industry areas, many different years of work experience and professional roles. Um, so as you think about your learning uh, throughout uh, Northwestern Kellogg programs, uh, one of the things that really sets it apart is a chance for you to see these concepts come to life in your organization, but also in those peer-to-peer -peer interactions, get a broadened scope of understanding, sort of a, a tapestry of ideas, um, and, and really help to broaden out your knowledge as you see the same concepts come to life uh, for your peers in their respective industries and geographies. So certainly a chance for you to have both a deep knowledge as well as a broadened perspective. Um, and all of this together um, in a rich and interactive environment. So the online program here is one that's highly interactive, highly relationship-based. It's going to keep your learning in a place of transformation, really allowing you to transform um, with timely, actionable content. Uh, so that hopefully gives you a sort of a good stage setting as as we think more specifically about this program here, uh, business analytics, de decision making with data. So if you're here, you know this already, you're at the right place. Um, if you're here to, to learn how to leverage analytics to accelerate business growth, um, and certainly, uh, you know, as you think about 
uh, the, the need to do this. Uh, it, it stretches across the gamut um, of different professional roles and industries as you think about analytics and the ways in which uh, we're depending more and more on data um, in order to drive business decision making and innovation. Uh, so as you think about your role, uh, your current role, uh, your your aspirations, your career aspirations, uh, here's some of the here's some of the uh, respective professions that we had in mind here when we designed the program. Uh, so you might be a mid to senior level manager, um, and you want to better incorporate analytics into your business initiatives, um, help better distinguish between good and bad analytics, and use visualization tools to really tell a story um, and create that buy-in across internal and external stakeholders. Um, so certainly uh, this program is going to help you to do that, to help you to better understand data and help you to better visualize uh, data as well. Uh, you might be an analyst and you want to understand how you can better align your work with business objectives and support management and achieving their outcomes. Um, and of course, if you're a consultant um, and you're helping um, your, uh, your, your clients uh, with data science initiatives and you want to learn a comprehensive analytics framework um, in order to help you to do that, uh, get those tips and techniques and, and techniques, uh, this, this program is going to help, help you to do that as well. Um, so as you think about this idea of program fit, uh, this is a big part of what you're here to explore. Is this the right program for me? Um, one of the things uh, that we'll be, we'll be talking about throughout the program is the ways in which these concepts um, are going to help you to make those actionable um, decisions uh, within your professional roles. Um, but certainly let us know in the question box, let us know in the chat um, if you have any specific questions related to your role and the way this program um, is designed and, and whether or not that's gonna help you to achieve uh, those, go those goals. So, um, and this is where we describe some of those overarching learning objectives. Uh, Professor Zettelmeyer uh, will help to highlight some of these throughout his uh, presentation here today. Um, but throughout these nine weeks, these are those high level learning objectives. And by the end of the program, these are the things you'll be able to do. Uh, you'll be able to identify where in your, in your organization analytics adds value. You'll be able to build the confidence required to operate in a data-driven environment, develop the ability and intuition to judge good analytics and bad analytics, understand the importance of experimentation platforms to drive business growth, learn how to tell a persuasive story with data visualization tools and build a working knowledge of data science. And so if this all sounds good to you, uh, you are in the right place um, as we learn more about this program here from today's keynote faculty presenter and star of the show, Professor Florian Zettelmeyer. Uh, we, we met you a, a moment ago, Professor Zettelmeyer. You have some more details here um, in your bio about your, your, your background, your research and your interests. Um, I wanna invite you into the spotlight uh, to tell us more about what brought you to this program um, and then to uh, tell us more about your co-collaborators um, that you work together with in the design of today's curriculum. Um, over to you, Professor Zettelmeyer. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Marie. Um, yeah, so what got me to this program is I've been a data scientist all my life. Uh, I have a PhD from MIT. Uh, and um, for the first 10 years of my career, I was at Berkeley uh, in California. And uh, a long time ago, actually in 2004, it's hard to believe, uh, I actually developed uh, the first program in any, in any MBA program um, on custom analytics. In other words, on how to use data for marketing purposes. And uh, that sort of got me into this journey of being interested in making data-driven decisions and, and making decisions with data. And then um, in um, uh, 2008, I came to Kellogg. And when I was at Kellogg, I, I realized that there were a whole bunch of my colleagues who were also doing things like this. And so we I ended up founding our so-called program on data analytics at the school. Um, and we built a curriculum up on this. The initiative that I've really worked hard on over the last seven to eight years is to take all that content that we have developed for MBA students and ask myself, okay, there are a lot of people out there who didn't get the opportunity to learn this stuff at MBA programs and who are now much, much more senior than that. What could we do in order to help them uh, deal in this new world in which data is used for decision-making? And that led us through a multi-year development effort uh, to generate a series of programs at Kellogg, uh, open enrollment, as well as a lot of different custom programs for clients where we try to teach the type of audiences that you just described 
how to make better decisions with data. Uh, and so we gave those you know, different names from leading with big data analytics to leading with advanced analytics and artificial intelligence, et cetera. Um, and so this is our kind of culmination, this program of trying to take that content and put it in a online asynchronous format uh, with, of course, a strong component of um, seeing us personally and interacting with us and, and so on. And uh, so I'm, I'm really excited to, to do this. Uh, I have multiple roles. I, I run this program on data analytics. I head up uh, our executive education efforts together with Eric Anderson, who was my um, co-conspirator, co-designer in this program. And then in addition to that, uh, as you mentioned, I've been chair of the marketing department. Um, yeah. Thank you, Marie. Uh, let me go on and um, just uh, show you who else we have here. So the next person is um, Eric Anderson. So Eric Anderson is uh, my co-designer of this program. Uh, Eric wears a number of different hats. He is um, also a marketing professor, the Hart Marks uh, Professor of Marketing, and he also runs a center called the Center for Global Marketing Practice. Uh, he also is our, the head of our new MBAI program, uh, which is a combination MBA program with an um, artificial intelligence master's degree in our engineering school. So he heads that. Uh, in addition to that, he has a lot of practical experiences on the board of directors of Canadian Tire, which is a $15 billion retailer in Canada. If you're Canadian, you definitely know Canadian Tire. It's a very famous company. Um, and um, yeah, and so that that that's uh, the background. He also actually was marketing chair before me, so he has a ton of experience in this field as well. Um, let me go on. We have two more faculty uh, here who are going to teach. The first one is Steve Franconeri. Steve Franconeri is kind of an extraordinary guy. He is a psychology professor, uh, but his specialty is um, to deal with visualizations. So he has a whole lab that thinks about how to learn from visualizations and from data, but also how to communicate with data. And so he teaches a really uh, nice module in our course. Um, uh, he um, is a consultant for Tableau, so he knows a ton of uh, um, a ton of things in this area. And then the last faculty that teaches here is a, a gentleman called uh, Chris Hammond. He's a professor of computer science and a, actual, a real pioneer in artificial intelligence. Uh, he himself is the chief scientist at a company called Narrative Science, which um, ends up focusing on taking data and automatically with AI generating uh, descriptions of that data in form of text. So for example, he has, the company provides uh, automatic article writings for small town baseball games or for financial analyst reports uh, based on portfolio movements and things like that. And Chris is gonna share his insights with us on how to build AI teams and um, kind of how uh, what, what you can do with AI. So it's a really uh, exciting area. Okay, so let me give you um, an idea of what the program is. And uh, what I thought I would do um, to get us started is to start you off with one of the beginnings of the program, because I want to give you sort of a rich flavor for the content that we're going to present. And so let me just sort of dive right in. And I'm going to give that maybe 10, 15 minutes uh, so you know kind of what the motivating story for us is. And then I'm going to switch over to actually telling you about the exact structure and the modules of the program. And of course, please feel free up to uh, bring up um, any questions that you may have, and I'd be happy to try to answer them. Okay, so um, the, the um, situation that we have here and that I want to start with is um, uh, uh, best illustrated by this person. And it's a story that nearly all of you know. It's the um, Moneyball story by Michael Lewis. Uh, and because a few of you may not have seen the movie or read the book, with your permission, I want to quickly retell the story in a few minutes. And of course, the picture, by the way, is Brad Pitt, who plays a pivotal character in that movie um, called Billy Bean. Um, now, for those of you that uh, haven't seen this, I, I'm going to give you uh, an ending that's very, very different. Uh, and that'll be kind of your real reward for sticking with me in this time. All right. So um, this is a story that starts in 2002 when the Oakland A's had one of the smallest budgets for player salaries of any team in baseball, about $30 million compared to over $100 million for the New York Yankees. Can you imagine what it felt 
like to be outspent by a team you're competing with by a factor of about three to one. It's kind of scary. Now, at the time, the Oakland A's had a general manager called Billy Bean, and he's a former major league player who was a very high draft pick, uh, meaning that uh, when he was initially recruited, he was really high up on the list of the best players. But to everybody's surprise, he never really amounted to very much. He bounced from team to team and eventually ended up at the Oakland A's. He then asked himself after a while, or after a while, um, he moved from being a player to becoming a scout based on his own wishes. And then he worked himself up to being general manager of the team. Now, because he was frustrated by his inability of recruiting the best players, he hires an assistant called Paul de Podesta. Um, and that, and Paul is an economic major, economics major from Harvard who's interested in baseball statistics. And given that they have so little money, Billy Bean and Paul de Podesta ask this question. Which player statistics, hold on, we have here, there you go. Uh, apologize, I just noticed that this went one to four. Which player statistics contributed most to baseball runs, which are, of course, uh, the points scored? Now, to answer this question, these guys uh, do some analytics. And the analytics showed that what matters most for runs scored was on-base percentage and slugging percentage. And it doesn't really matter what these are, but it does matter what they're not. Namely, they're not what the scouts were looking for. They're not what baseball statistics has usually emphasized. And most importantly, they're not what players got high salaries for. And because of that, De Podesta and Billy Bean believed that this implied that there were some players that were undervalued, that there had to be some players that did badly on traditional metrics, but did really well on the metrics that they knew mattered. And this represented, in their view, an arbitrage opportunity because these players would be cheap to get. And so the Oakland A begins hiring these players. And the result is that the Oakland A start winning a lot. Now, I'm telling you the story because many people think the story was, if you like, a baseball's analytics moment. It was truly revolutionary. As you probably know, all big sports teams now have analytics teams. And in fact, the two biggest stories in baseball over the last 20 years are directly connected to the story. The first one being that the Boston Red Sox in 2004 broke the so-called curse of the Bambino, uh, which happened when they traded Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees and therefore had a very, and it's rumored that they had a really long losing streak because of that. And this was broken when Theo Epstein, who was the assistant of Paul de Podesta, actually went to the, uh, to the Red Sox and um, ended up uh, winning the World Series. And then um, Theo Epstein also came in uh, to the uh, Chicago Cubs and ended up winning the World Series in 2016, breaking a 108-year losing streak. Okay, so that's the, the reason I wanted to, to, to just kind of give you a little recap. But... What I really want to talk about today is the timing of this analytics moment. In other words, why did it happen in 2002? What were the catalysts that let the Oakland A start um, basing their strategy on analytics? And so um, let's think through this. So the first question that you might ask is, well, you know, if you're looking for a catalyst, hmm, maybe what was going on is that there was new data that was made available at this time. And I don't know how much you guys know about baseball, but um, uh, are there, do you guys have any guesses as to how old this data is in your head? I don't know, is it 10 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old? It actually turns out to be that baseball data is over 100 years old. So the answer is that new data absolutely wasn't the catalyst for these guys starting to use analytics um, as, a, as, a, as an approach to playing baseball. The data had been around forever and the whole um, field had actually been quite data driven. Okay, so if it's not new data, then could it be that there were some kind of new statistical methods? Uh, could it be that there was this existing data that um, you could, where you could suddenly apply really cool new machine learning methods that would supercharge the insight generated out of that data. And again, the answer is no, not really. These guys used regular regression, which was invented in like the mid 1850s. 
uh, and had been around forever. And most of you have probably learned either in college or in graduate school. So um, uh, nothing particularly interesting. So no new data, no new statistical methods. All right, so maybe the catalyst then was, I don't know, maybe new computational capabilities, right? So we have a real um, massive sea change in how computing works. Uh, this is close to the time that Amazon Web Services starts. Uh, maybe these guys took the existing data and the very simple models and they managed to supercharge it around across many different computer servers and somehow got better insights with that. And again, the answer is no. Uh, they did this analysis on sort of a PC sitting under a rusty desk in the Oakland Coliseum, and that was quite enough to get the insights. Okay, and so if there are no new data, no new statistical capabilities, no new computational capabilities, I don't know, maybe the last item I can think of is maybe there was new statistical talent that ended up leading to this change. And so there are actually two important, um, uh, there are two important actors here. The first one is Paul de Podesta that I mentioned to you before. Um, and, um, you know, I mentioned to you, I went to MIT and we at MIT refer to Harvard as a little liberal arts college up the river. Uh, and so I'm going to tell you with the full authority that that statement gives me that Paul de Podesta was not a rocket scientist, a very smart dude, but not a rocket scientist. So um, I'm not sure that was really the reason either. And then finally, there's another person called Bill James, who is a legend in modern baseball statistics, who in 1977 started putting out a yearbook in which he ended up uh, explaining what he had learned about baseball the prior year. And what's important about this is that Bill James pointed out many years before um, uh, I pointed out that many years before um, he actually ended up, uh, Billy Bean rediscovered that slugging percentage and on-base percentage were very predictive of winning baseball games, that um, uh, those two things mattered a lot. And now uh, we have a little bit of a puzzle because the reason that you're taking a class on analytics is because at many companies, there really are new data. There really are new statistical methods, like some machine learning algorithms. There really are new computational capabilities, like cloud computing. And there really is new talent, what we now call data scientists. All of these things for the Moneyball story, however, were in place in 2002. So the question is, why did it not happen in 1992 or, I don't know, 1982 or potentially 1972? Because all of the ingredients were actually present at that time. In other words, what is left? Uh, what led to this Moneyball story occurring in 2002? And I think what's left is this guy. Um, this is the real Billy Bean. And I think the key difference was that Billy Bean had an understanding of analytics that gave him the courage to bet the future of the Oakland A's on this approach. And it wasn't that his ideas were necessarily new, but they were not part of the conventional wisdom of the people in charge of teams. And I'm telling you this story because it highlights the importance of business leaders and managers in making analytics useful. Fundamentally, the success of analytics and AI require data science expertise. However, they require an equal parts business leadership. And our course is designed to give you that ability to apply your leadership skills to scale analytics and AI. So what will you be able to do with this? What you will learn is how to improve marketing, how to create operational efficiencies, how to build new business models, how to disrupt the industry status quo, how to master insights to leverage data, and how to boost productivity. So how are we going to get you to do that? Because that is a tall order and a big promise. Well, the course is split into eight modules. And um, I want to start with module one uh, and then sort of walk you slowly through each of these modules so you get a good idea of what's in store for you. So let's start with one. The starting point for how we think about data analytics at, data analytics at Kellogg is that at its core, analytics is every business problems, every business person's issue, that it is not your boss's problem or the problem of another department, 
or the problem of a few data scientists, or even the problem of an analytics department, and certainly not just the problem of your CEO, that it's instead your personal issue. The reason is that the hardest parts of making analytics and AI work are not the data science or the technology. Instead, all the main challenges are ones that leaders like you have to solve. But if analytics is your issue, this means that you will need to be involved in driving analytics at every step of the way. And the question then is, well, what makes you effective when you are involved in driving analytics? We're going to argue that what you need is what we call a working knowledge of data science. This working knowledge of data science will allow you to judge what good looks like, to identify where analytics adds value, and to lead with confidence. We then lay the foundation for this working knowledge of data science. And we do this by uh, begin teaching you what we call the Kellogg Analytics Framework. And the goal of this framework is to provide you as a manager or as a leader with a clear process for tackling analytics initiatives and to give you a consistent language to talk about analytics, which is exploratory, predictive, and causal analytics. And we believe that a common language and a framework are essential for driving growth with analytics because it actually aligns everybody, which is a really big deal. Okay. Module two. In module two, what we're going to do is we're going to start diving into exploratory analytics and we're going to focus on visualizations. So we're going to start by first providing an overview of best practices in visualizing data. You will learn how your brain makes comparisons and in turn, how you create visualizations where comparisons are easy and obvious. And after learning about best practices in visualization, we will then turn to consuming analytics. In other words, we will learn how to interpret, properly interpret visualization of analytic results. As you know, today, nearly every firm creates reports with charts and figures and tables. And you will learn how to apply a checklist that will allow you to quickly assess whether the visualization actually implies what the author says it does imply. And this is a really important first step in building your working knowledge of data science. Now, module three, before we jump into designing experiments or how to interpret predictive analytics models, we want to teach you something that everybody needs to know regardless of how involved you want to be with analytics. That's the content of module three. We call it distinguishing good from bad analytics. In other words, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to turn you into a good consumer of analytics. Today, everybody is bombarded with data and reports and analysis that claims to back up a conclusion that somebody else wants you to believe in. And we want to show you how to disentangle quickly what you should believe and what, you should leave, and what should leave you skeptical. You should know the questions to ask about analytics-based conclusions when others are trying to persuade you. So that's module three. In module four, your role in the program is going to change from a consumer of analytics to an active participant in analytics. We want to begin by understanding whether an initiative worked. And so you will first learn about best practices and business experiments, which is the foundation for causal analytics. A learning goal is to understand, and, and, and that's right, but in, in some cases, a, a true experiments are actually quite difficult um, or, or costly to implement or frankly impossible. And as a result of that, many firms use what are referred to as quasi-experiments, which essentially approximate a true experiment in settings where true experiments are impossible. And we're going to introduce you to how those work. Now, in module five, what we're going to do is a super fun real-life simulation where you get to practice how to run a quasi-experiment. So we have this whole elaborate simulation set up where um, uh, we're working uh, on a case of a financial services company that has to um, 
develop a marketing program uh, in order to support uh, partners in Canada uh, and needs to figure out how to allocate the funds of that program in a way that simultaneously maximizes the incremental benefit of that program, but also allows it to make an ongoing decision about what types of partners to support. And so it's a very interesting, very real life. It actually comes from a real case um, situation in which you get to practice your quasi-experimental chops. So it's very fun. Okay, uh, module six. So module think six is about the last important type of analytics in our framework, what we call predictive analytics. When you think of predictions, uh, you should think of questions like, how much will certain types of consumers spend on new products? What's the best type of ad to show to a target group? How likely is a machine to break down? Um, when should we show content to users? Things like that. In this module, um, we dive into how predictions work and show you that making predictions or figuring it out how to anticipate an outcome based on information you have, that's a prediction, can be complicated, but that gaining intuition about them needn't be. And then in addition to discussing how predictions work, we will explore the limits for applications and provide a surprisingly simple explanation uh, of how one of the most popular prediction models used by nearly every company's data science team works. We will help you understand how to assess the performance of predictions, especially when applied to unfamiliar situations such as new sets of customers. And then finally, or lastly, we're going to explain why some predictions work spectacularly well, while others fail miserably. And there's actually a surprisingly easy reason for that. Okay, so that's module six. By the time that you have finished module six, you will have learned exploratory analytics, predictive analytics, and causal analytics, the three big buckets of analytics. In module seven, we want to spend some time explaining um, that analytics is a, a means to an end and that success um, is rarely measured by the quality of the analytics alone. Instead, you will achieve success when analytics leads to better decisions. And that's the last piece of the Kellogg Analytics Framework. You're gonna learn that good decisions follow from careful planning, anticipating the complexity of real world problems and integrating your expertise with analytics. Okay, last module, module eight. We have seen incredible advances in technology in recent years, many driven by artificial intelligence and machine learning. Everything from AlphaGo beating the world's best Go player, Google revolutionary the trans uh, revolutionizing the translation service, self-driving cars, face recognition that really works, obviously the rise of Alexa and Google Home and so on, and many other applications as well. And while AI may seem magical to many and data scientists may seem all knowing, our goal is to remove all the magic and help you navigate the AI and machine learning world with confidence. And so in module eight, you will learn about the building blocks that have made advances like these possible. You will learn that what is needed in an organization to solve business problems with artificial intelligence and machine learning, as well as instances when these technologies may not be as helpful as you think. Okay, and this completes the working knowledge of data science. And what it will do is it will allow you to do three things. It will allow you to judge what good looks like, it will allow you to identify in your business where analytics adds value and how to achieve value with it. And then finally, it will also allow you to lead with a degree of confidence because you can get into a room and talk to a bunch of data scientists and know that you can use their skills and transform them into real business value. All right, so that's these, th this covers kind of these eight modules. Now, um, one of the things uh, that we're really excited about that I wanted to share with you is Eric Anderson and I have recently written a book 
uh, that we hope you will find interesting. Um, it is a book that um, roughly actually follows the outline of this course. Um, and it is a really interesting, um, not necessary, but a recommended companion uh, to the content in this program, because it allows you to absorb in a different medium and with different examples, some of the things that we teach you in this program. Um, so it's a book that um, tries to hit a, a sweet spot, I think, uh, compared to what's out there. So in our experience, there are sort of two types of contents around analytics and AI. The first kind of content are um, what I would call a sort of very, very specialized data science books, which are really not particularly interesting for business people. They're way too technical, way too in the weeds. They're kind of how-to books uh, that are much more relevant for junior people or the kinds of people that you would manage or supervise. Um, and then there are books that I would uh, classify in the airport book category. So they're like, you know, the analytics equivalent of the seven habits of highly successful people, uh, which, as you can tell from my, my statement, I don't have a ton of respect for because they are sort of very inspirational, but they don't really teach you a lot of uh, tangible skills about how to uh, create value with analytics. And what we've tried to do is to hit exactly the middle ground. So uh, our book is meant to be for managers of business leaders, they don't have a huge amount of background in this stuff, but we also take the data science super seriously. So you will actually come out of it um, at a level appropriate to somebody who doesn't have a statistics background, but you will come away with that working knowledge of data science. And so we hope that that's something that is uh, very uh, helpful for you. Now, with that in mind, um, I think Marie is going to tell you a little bit about the learning experience of this course. Marie, over to you. Uh, thank you for being here with us and for taking us through this program content, um, you know, and really sh showcasing, you know, that through line of logic and how this curriculum was developed um, and the ways in which it's going to provide value. Um, so we're going to shift over here to the learning experience. Um, what is it like to be a participant in this program? What is that day-to-day -day experience like? And as we described towards uh, the beginning of our time together, and as was highlighted by Professor Zettelmeyer, um, sort of the two big uh, uh, experiences that you can expect to have here in this program are, you know, first and foremost, a high level of relationship uh, building uh, interaction. Uh, this is a highly relational program. Uh, so th that's a big component here. And then the second one is a, a highly convenient experience. Uh, so as Professor Zettelmeyer described, I'm really bringing this content to you in an asynchronous fashion, um, allowing you to have that perfect blend of a highly convenient learning experience that you can really drive through um, around your own availability and your own schedule and your own time commitments, while also um, maintaining those components that are interactive and um, still uh, sort of peppering out throughout the program, live webinars and office hours um, that allow you to learn in that synchronous way and build those relationships. Relationships. Uh, so no two cohorts of this program are the same. Uh, this is a reciprocal learning environment. Uh, you're going to be contributing as well as receiving knowledge. Um, and certainly your, your faculty and your course leaders um, are a big part of how we are able to individualize uh, your educational experience. So you come in with your questions, you come in um, with your ideas, uh, with your challenges, um, and really co-create as you make your way through the curriculum. Um, and have those real-time discussions with your peers and with your course leaders. Um, so as you think about the different layers of teaching and learning that are taking place here in the program, um, I, I'm a visual uh, person. I like to think of uh, the, the various uh, circles, sort of sort of concentric circles of teaching and learning. Uh, you're at the center as an individual learner. You have your peers surrounding you that you're learning together with and from. You know, a layer beyond that, you have your course leaders. Um, these are industry experts who have been invited into this program um, by Kellogg. Uh, to serve as your teaching fellows, really guide that day-to-day -day experience. Um, they're on the discussion boards with you and your peers, um, helping to push your thinking and drive engagement. Uh, your course leaders are hosting these live office hours here, um, and they're also responding to your queries throughout the program. Uh, so a lot of opportunity here for you to engage live uh, with subject matter experts. Um, they also provide you with individualized feedback on your assignments. 
Uh, so you're not simply just um, submitting assignments for completion, um, but you're really getting uh, that tailored uh, teaching experience from your course leaders. A layer beyond that, you have your program faculty, Professor Zettelmeyer and his co-creators um, here as described in the program, really at the helm of that learning curriculum. And then a layer beyond that, you have Northwestern Kellogg and this broader uh, community that you're joining here. And this is all housed together uh, by a dedicated program support team who's available 24-7 uh, to help assist you uh, throughout your experience in the program. And so a lot of different opportunities for support, a lot of opportunities to build relationships while you learn um, in order to enrich and enhance the learning experience. Um, so uh, the other thing to note here is you have access to the program for an entire year. Uh, so it is a nine week program, uh, but you'll be able to touch in, watch the videos, take a look at those assignments and discussion threads for an entire year. Um, you can also access the program from a mobile device or a tablet at Learn on the Go. That's part of that convenience of having um, asynchronous material that allows you to touch in on your own schedule. And uh, so you're able to touch in as well um, on the go from a mobile device. So so those are some of those uh, tactical components there. And um, as you think about the key takeaways, you have your learning here in the program, but you also have a chance here um, to earn a certificate of completion. Uh, this is a credential from Kellogg Executive Education, um, a digital uh, copy that you can put on your LinkedIn profile um, or other social media. You can bring this with you into a job interview. Um, and certainly for those of you looking to springboard into career advancement opportunities, um, having a credential here from Northwestern Kellogg is going to go a long way in assisting you and um, helping you to do just that. There's a new set of frameworks and strategies and methodologies to apply to your work. And so a lot of rich opportunity here. Um, you can see the program is uh, coming up just around the corner. Um, so we want to make sure that that high level of relationship building and support that we're describing, we want that to start right here, right now with today's session. Uh, so we invite you to get connected uh, with one of our program academic advisors. Um, our program advising team are here with us live on the call. They are our course foremost experts when it comes to all of the logistics for the program, all of the course registration details, and all of the course policy information. So a lot of you might have questions. We're sort of at that stage in the process where you're thinking about getting your enrollment materials together, uh, finalizing your application. Uh, so we want to make sure you're connected with one of these um, academic advisors who's here with us because uh, they're closest to those logistical details. Um, they can help walk you through the schedule of the program, uh, provide you with calendar holds for any of the live sessions and answer any of your questions related to dates and schedules. And they can also help you with any course policy questions. So for example, um, you know, how do I earn that certificate of completion? What's the evaluative criteria for the program? Or you might have questions about your alumni status. You know, what degree of um, interaction and alumni circles uh, can I expect after graduating from this program? Uh, so they'll be able to walk you through those policy details. And then of course, um, the registration process. Um, if you're interested in flexible and transparent payment options, uh, they can help uh, assist you with knowing more about special group enrollment pricing uh, financing options um, and other uh, enrollment benefits. You can see at the top of your screen, uh, if you invite a colleague, uh, there's an enrollment benefit there. Uh, so certainly a lot of opportunity for you to discuss the financing of this program together with the registration. So how do you get connected with a program advisor? Um, if you haven't uh, done so already, you'll see there's a QR code there on your screen. Um, if you take that QR code and you go over to the course page, you'll see there's a, a course website that looks very similar to what you see here on your screen. Um, and if you click on that apply now button there, um, it will invite you to put in your contact details and schedule a one-on-one -on -one session with one of our academic advisors. Uh, so we use a Calendly link uh, so you can go right into to the course website and find a time that works best for your schedule to getting connected with one of our academic advisors. Um, if, you, if you don't have a smartphone and you can't use that QR code, uh, we're gonna put a link there in the chat for you that will also get you over uh, to our course landing page where you can put in your contact details and get connected with an advisor. So as we mentioned, um, your academic advisors are going to help you with those logistical policy and registration questions, um, but we do have Professor Zettermeyer here with us um, uh, for those content questions or those questions related to business analytics. 
Uh, does the course touch on synthetic data generation appropriate no. use? Uh, this is a big issue in healthcare. So um, I'm going to invite you back into the frame here, Professor Zettelmeyer. So um, our course doesn't, we, we don't work on uh, sort of super industry specific issues. Um, so a lot of the stuff that we do, I think is very relevant for the healthcare industry. We do not talk specifically about synthetic data generation, mostly because of the fact that um, uh, uh, that applies to only a relatively few settings in which that's particularly useful. And so we don't talk about it, but we could certainly talk about that and bring that up during one of our live sessions and have a discussion around it. So I hope that, that that helps a little bit. Yeah, I believe this is sort of a quick answer, but you know, in terms of how you design the program, um, are there any additional purchases or things that folks should be thinking about in terms of software, tools, technologies, um, computing uh, uh, preferences, not anything a, like not, that? Not at all. Not at all. I mean, we do assume that you have Microsoft Excel on your computer um, because we use that in the CPE simulation. But I think that is the only, um, so, you know, Excel. But I think that's the only piece of software that you would need. Everything else that we have is just, you know, the usual, you need a PDF reader and things like that. But we don't require to you buy any specialized software in this. Yeah, so we often get the question um, in this program, you know, how technical do we go? Um, how in the weeds do we get? Are, are we having to, you know, learn Python? You know, what, what degree of technicality sort of on that scale um, are we going into in the program? I know you've described sort of these high level business components. Um, are we going into that, that place of really uh, looking at data and applying data um, throughout the program? We get to the place of um, interpreting data big time, but we don't go into the place of, um, taking, say, for example, a completely messy, unstructured data set and then having to produce a visualization yourself or having to summarize it. Um, mostly because, frankly, um, those kinds of skills to do that are a bunch of levels below the typical audience for our program. Um, so you would typically have people who would do that for you. In fact, I would turn this around and I would say, if that's what you're doing, you should hire somebody to do it because you're too qualified to actually, and, and you have too much managerial expertise in order to do that. So, so we don't, but there's, the, the, everything has to do with the interpretation layer and how to make sense of it. That we have in spades. Um, so no Python or R, um, but again, uh, those are super specialized skills uh, and they are skills that, right? To me, this is exactly the cutting line. If you're actually you yourself going to use Python or R, then you are in fact a candidate for a specialized data science course, but then you want to become a data scientist. You're not a business person who is going to supervise or work with data scientists. And this course is squarely in the bucket of you're a business person to do this. But as I mentioned to you, the fact that we don't do Python and R doesn't mean that your brain is not going to smoke. It will smoke. It will just smoke based on how to think about data as opposed to say, actually code it. Yes, thank you for uh, making that distinction. Um, and so if you're not able to uh, join uh, this course that is launching just around the corner, and but you're interested in a future run of the program, uh, certainly get connected with an advisor. They'll put you on their short list and you'll be the first to know uh, once that date is finalized. Um, so it looks in the middle of a job transition um, and you're not sure about your time commitments. And one of the things that this program provides you with is the opportunity uh, to think about um, enhancing uh, your career and stepping back into the job market. So Professor Zettemeyer, for folks who are in between roles right now, I know a lot of what we do is we talk about how we can apply the learning to our current professional roles. Um, but for folks, as so many are um, today, uh, sort of transitioning between roles, um, how can that learning be applied if, if you don't have a specific organization that you're working with uh, during your time in the program? Um, you know, relatively, I mean, really easy, Marie, because the truth of the matter is that what we're doing is we're building a human capital up. And uh, I think what's important about this, um, you know, when this whole topic started about using data, in a way, there were specific jobs that were dealt that, that had to deal with using data. That's no longer true today. So when I talk to the leaders that we interact with at Kellogg, it has basically become a general management skill. Um, and as a result of that, um, it is a relatively job agnostic uh, where you can use these skills. So, I mean, we have seen these skills 
very successfully applied in uh, jobs that are um, operations jobs, jobs that are marketing jobs. Um, these skills are absolutely crucial if you're, for example, a product manager in a tech industry. Uh, in fact, it's sort of hard to, uh, it will be virtually impossible to not have these skills and be successful at a Microsoft or an Amazon or uh, an Apple these days. Um, they are extremely helpful in finance jobs. They're really helpful in accounting jobs. So um, wide gamut, really, Mary. So there's a, a ton of application for us. Um, so with that, Professor Zettelmeyer, we've uh, reached the end of our uh, the session, um, but just uh, I want to refer one more time there to the link um, in your chat box. Um, if you haven't yet gotten connected with an academic advisor, they're here with us on the call. Uh, please use the link there in the chat. Um, there's also an email address. So if you prefer uh, not to use the website, but rather to coordinate by email, um, you can certainly email us at kellogg at emeritus.org. That's listed there in your chat as well. Um, let us know you need an advisor and we'll get you connected uh, with one of our course academic advisors. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to invite back into the spotlight one last time here, Professor Zettelmeyer. Um, any closing thoughts that you'd like to leave us with, particularly for participants who are considering joining uh, this upcoming cohort? Yeah, so um, I think what I would end up with is um, there's this expression in the, in the healthcare industry, uh, which is to, um, people are referred to as, as evidence-based medicine. Uh, this idea that, and, and it, so, it sounds really odd because uh, when you hear the word evidence-based medicine, you, you figure out like, what the heck did people do before evidence medicine, evidence-based medicine was invented? But what it really means is relying on scientific evidence as opposed to just your own training or your own experience as a physician. And I think that um, data and analytics is leading to the same type of change in business is that your own experience and your own training are no longer enough. That the decisions that you made shouldn't just be based on your judgment, as important as that always remains to be, but it should also be based on the best possible available evidence. And I think what this course does is it takes that idea and really pushes somebody who doesn't have that much familiarity with this concept over the course of nine weeks into a situation where they really do have the ability of then making decisions that are based on data and evidence. And I think um, it makes a huge difference for the quality of decision-making. And that's what really I find so exciting. It's a way how to learn about the world and how to make better decisions in a large variety of contexts. And so that's what we're trying to deliver with this course. Um, and that's certainly um, a beautiful uh, description and even call to action, uh, really, as you think about making better decisions um, and using data to really um, better understand uh, and the nuance um, around the decision. So uh, certainly a, a, an exciting uh, program, an exciting opportunity uh, to enhance uh, your ability to really look at, at data as a source of information and, and helping to describe uh, the, your your decision making. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and close out today's session but, um, and staying with us uh, through the end of our time together. It's been an absolute honor uh, learning from you, Professor Zettelmeyer. Uh, so we'll be signing off here uh, with a heartfelt uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, and good day to all of you from around the globe. Thank you again for joining.